to give my uh, to give my uh, talk today. Um, and um, like Dr. Mihik said, uh, I'm going to be talking about transdiagnostic risk factors. And um, she gave an excellent definition of that. I'll of course expand on that uh, a little bit here for my talk, um, just to give you an idea of what I'm going to be doing. So I'm going to kind of briefly uh, introduce myself. Following that, I'm going to give kind of a broad overview of my research focus. I'll try to do it justice given the, uh, the description um, I was already given. And I'm going to talk about kind of three different uh, studies that kind of encapsulate uh, the types of approaches that I do with my research. Um, the first couple are, are really focused on improving measurement of transdiagnostic risk factors for emotional disorders. And then the last study is the most uh, recent work. In fact, these are uh, uh, from data that we uh, collected, uh, finished collecting, or at least finished collecting part of uh, two weeks ago. And this is about uh, uh, our preliminary work developing a brief intervention for emotional distress and really applying that um, in uh, the context of the, uh, the pandemic, helping people deal with their distress there. So uh, just to kind of give you a, a background of, of where I come from, I graduated uh, my undergrad from the University of Toledo in 2008 with uh, degrees in psychology and philosophy, a minor in chemistry. So I tried to span the whole gamut from the uh, liberal arts to the social sciences. Uh, received my uh, degree, my PhD from Florida State in 2016. Uh, during the 2015-2016 year, I attended uh, Medical University of South Carolina for internship. Uh, currently, I'm at Ohio University, been here since 2016. And then um, I also, just last year, uh, have a uh, half-time position as a researcher at the Center of Excellence for Suicide Prevention through the, uh, the VHA here. So this is my family. This is, you know, what's kind of uh, helped to keep me uh, sane and, and level during the, the pandemic. Uh, and the upper left quadrant there, those are my two daughters. I have uh, a daughter who just turned 21 on the 24th, and I have a daughter who just turned three yesterday. So in uh, another 15 years, I expect to have another daughter to kind of keep that cycle going. Haven't run those plans by my wife, who's uh, in the picture there on the lower right as well. Um, so that's a bit of uh, my background. And now I want to talk uh, a little bit about my research program. Uh, I conceptualize my research within a translational framework. And what I'm attempting to do is to leverage studies focused on um, construct validation and more basic science perspective. Uh, to improve how we measure some of these risk factors and use that uh, to then also feed forward into clinical practice and then vice versa. So in order to get this more holistic picture, I use a, a wealth of, of different methods. The ones that I am going to be focusing on here and kind of are at the, the vanguard of what I do um, include uh, data collection through uh, neurophysiological data collection, EEG, um, I also use a lot of uh, advanced statistical methods. And then uh, uh, in addition, lately over the last several years, I've become really uh, fascinated by what uh, mobile health or M health technologies can do for us, particularly um, when it comes to improving, uh, improving care. So my research focuses uh, primarily on mood and anxiety disorders and related conditions. You know, one of the, you know, kind of really simple reasons for this is that these are highly problematic, even though they aren't necessarily considered as sexy as some of the other disorders. These are um, impacting, you know, between one fifth to one third of the population uh, in our lifetime. And they're incredibly expensive. So uh, rate the cost for treating these disorders or dealing with disability. Uh, somewhere in the uh, range of $1 trillion annually worldwide. Um, and also important now, you can see that this risk is really getting compounded during the COVID pandemic. 
So you can see there the blue line represents rates of mental health disorders before the pandemic. And that red line that's just on the outer bounds of the blue confidence interval, uh, that re represents rates of um, mood and anxiety disorders uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's not as if we're going to have an, early, an orderly transition back to normal. And so I expect these rates uh, to continue or climb if we don't do something about it. So by far one of the most common ways to look at mood and anxiety disorders is to use the DSM or um, a similar model like the, the ICD. And these are designed to serve as these kind of flexible guides for organizing information and, and helping us to more accurately uh, diagnose and treat mental disorders. Uh, and so through the years, this kind of process has been reified. However, um, there's a lot of uh, issues related to this particular process um, that I think uh, a risk factor approach can maybe be a more uh, fitting model moving forward. So uh, uh, like I said, I, I think if we focus on risk factors, there are some, some benefits um, when we're looking at mood and anxiety disorders. Um, and just to, to give you a definition for risk factors, these are considered cognitive or psychological vulnerabilities. Uh, they tend to have biological and environmental origins. And uh, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, we, we tended to think of risk factors kind of siloed off. We would think about uh, specific risk factors for specific disorders, um, but our thinking has really uh, change now, and, and we really think of these as fundamental processes underlying multiple disorders. And as such, they offer some, some really uh, potentially impactful targets for both research and treatment. So there are several benefits to this approach. Uh, one is it uh, offers a more parsimonious explanation for the comorbidity we find among disorders. Uh, it provides some simple treatment targets, as you'll hear me uh, briefly talking about when I talk about my intervention work. Um, for my work related to neural indicators, it, it offers more feasible targets because it, uh, these risk factors don't have the same issues with uh, the heterogeneity that you'll find uh, in a symptom profile for disorders like anxiety or depression. Um, so whereas there are several risk factors that can be looked at, and these are just some examples, anxiety, sensitivity, loneliness, intolerance of uncertainty, and emotion regulation, um, the risk factor that I focus the most on is anxiety sensitivity. This is considered the fear of fear, essentially fear of uh, anxious arousal. And anxiety sensitivity is a multidimensional construct comprising physical, cognitive, and, and social domains. So as far as how anxiety sensitivity seems to impact the, the process of developing uh, mood and anxiety disorders or functional impairment related to this through the disorders um, occurs in a, a model such as this. So it, it serves to really exacerbate the experience of anxiety. And then for those with high anxiety sensitivity, uh, this exacerbation is, is going to increase the odds that somebody is going to choose a maladaptive coping strategy. So some sort of avoidance or fleeing or even uh, maladaptive substance use. And if we string together enough of these feedback loops, you're gonna really increase the odds that someone is going to meet for a diagnostic threshold for a disorder. And even barring that, they're gonna reach levels where their anxiety and, and distress is going to be functionally impairing. So in order, I think, to really understand these constructs and, and understand um, you know, how they're malleable, how we can best target them, I think we need to understand them across multiple uh, units of analysis. This is similar uh, to, in the US, the National Institute of Mental Health Research Domain a criterion approach. So for those of you who are familiar with that, you'll see that uh, my framework mirrors a lot of that. And so in an ideal world, we would be capturing anxiety sensitivity across multiple domains. This would include uh, 
uh, not only somebody's self-report, uh, but also uh, biological and behavioral processes. However, unfortunately, uh, most of what we know about AS is in the self-report domain. And so I'm gonna briefly talk uh, about a study that I conducted attempting to identify a biological correlate of anxiety sensitivity. And then I'm gonna briefly touch on how that study fed into my current um, uh, grant that I'm conducting where we're attempting to expand beyond that lens and apply some of my statistical training to uh, more fully model the, the components that might represent anxiety sensitivity. So since my uh, last couple of years in graduate school, I've been really interested in how we can measure anxiety sensitivity across multiple modalities. And there's several reasons for this approach when studying risk factors. So one of the biggest is this can help reduce method variance, particularly since a lot of studies we've conducted um, in the field will look at self-reported risk factors and how they relate to self-reported uh, disorders. And so there's a there's typically a common distress element that's being picked up and overly inflating these relationships. Uh, in addition, because there isn't that same heterogeneity, it's easier to uh, link mood and anxiety disorders to underlying neurobiological systems. Um, and then finally, I, uh, this approach allows us to capture uh, the cognitive processes that are either underlying anxiety sensitivity um, or that are uh, modulated by it. So the particular type of biological uh, approach that I use is uh, event-related potentials. Those can be uh, captured through electroencephalogram, which includes recording the brain's uh, electrical activity along the scalp. Um, and then from that, that you can capture the event-related potential, which is measuring brain's response to particular stimuli. Uh, the task that I'm going to be talking about here that I used is the late positive potential. Uh, this is evoked in an emotional picture viewing paradigm, and it essentially captures an elevated neural responding to stimuli that somebody finds highly evocative or arousing. And what this tends to reflect is, is emotional salience uh, to an individual. Uh, this component tends to begin uh, from around 200 to 500 milliseconds, um, and it peaks at around 1,000 milliseconds. Uh, in addition, in this study, one of the, the things that I was interested in looking at is whether uh, there were gender differences in these different ways of measuring anxiety sensitivity. So we know that there are self-reported gender differences in anxiety sensitivity. And we know that those gender differences uh, mirror what we find in uh, anxiety. And so one of the questions that I was interested in addressing in, in the study I'm going to uh, talk about um, is whether there are also these objective differences um, or whether it really just is just an enhancement of the perception of uh, anxiety sensitivity. So this study had uh, two primary aims, three primary aims. Uh, the first was uh, to validate the late positive potential response to images designed to evoke anxiety sensitivity. Uh, second, I wanted to examine whether there were gender differences in, um, in that, so whether we could validate it for both males and females. Um, and then finally, I wanted to demonstrate discriminant validity. So looking at whether the response to the AS images uh, was related to anxiety sensitivity self-report when you controlled for responding to just unpleasant images in general. So as far as methods for this study, uh, participants came into our lab. They were affixed with a cap designed to measure ERPs, viewed a series of images that viewed in content. So that included neutral, pleasant, unpleasant, and uh, images designed to target anxiety sensitivity. And then the late positive potential was extracted from that data. So the sample uh, comprised 251 adults uh, that were recruited because they had elevated risk factors uh, for psychopathology. And uh, the vast majority of them presented with at least one uh, DSM disorder. 
And in this study, I'm going to be focusing primarily on uh, using the anxiety sensitivity index three to capture AS and the uh, LPP from the emotional picture viewing paradigm. So as far as data analytics plan, here's where the, the quant skills that I've acquired come into play. So I um, plan to use confirmatory factor analysis to model anxiety sensitivity and unpleasant images, late positive potentials. And so one of the things that we did here is we looked at the uh, sensors on the scalp that had the highest electrocortical uh, activity, and we use those as indicators in our CFAs. Uh, second, I uh, tested whether measurement and variance uh, would be present across males and females. And if there is measurement and variance, that essentially means we're measuring the same construct. Um, and then uh, I will use structural equation modeling to look at the relations between AS and unpleasant images uh, with self-reported AS. So here you can see that the anxiety sensitivity and negative images, late positive potential, begins around 400 millisecond. And on the right in those uh, TAFL maps, you can see that there's heightened activity in the centroparietal region. And so those are the sensors that we use when calculating the mean amplitude for participants. So uh, we're, uh, we found uh, measurement and variance. And so what that means is that we're capturing the same underlying construct in males and females, both with self-report and in responding to the images. Um, however, we did find uh, that the, and so to orient you to this figure on the right, the zero line, because we use latent variables, represents males mean levels of um, these constructs. And the, the bar extending from that captures females mean levels uh, compared to males. And so you can see there, uh, there were all, uh, they were all greater in females, both viewing the AS and unpleasant images um, and self-report compared to males. Uh, moving on to the structural equation model, uh, what we found here was that for males, there was not a significant relation between any of our uh, uh, late positive potential indicators and self-report. Uh, however, when we looked at it for females, there was in fact a relation, albeit a, a modest one. So uh, together, these findings indicate that the AS images LPP could serve as a useful neurophysiological correlate of AS self-report. Um, it also provides support for this notion that anxiety sensitivity is elevated in females, even at the, uh, the uh, biological processes level. Um, and so this, this suggests that perhaps the ASLPP could be a biological correlate for females. Um, but it also really suggests that we need better methods to home in on these biological correlates. And so I'm just gonna briefly mention my, my current uh, grant funded study. Um, it's basically we're fitting a model based off of uh, Chris Patrick's psychoneurometric index. The idea here is we're gonna be looking at event-related potentials, a, a whole battery of them designed to capture anxiety sensitivity. And we're gonna look at whether those are uh, capturing variants similar to what you'll see in self-report. Uh, one of the additions that I've uh, put into, into my model here is uh, to fit what I'm calling a psychoneurometric bifactor index. And essentially this allows us to not only capture what's common among these two different measurement modalities, but it also allows us to look at what's different. And so essentially, if we were to fit that first model and find that there isn't a lot of common variance, we would be at the end of uh, the study. But with this particular model, um, we can actually look at whether there are uh, differences or we can look at these additional components. Uh, the goal from there is to then look at how AS and IU relate to uh, different constructs from different research domains. Uh, at the moment, we've collected data on approximately 90 participants and uh, hoping that we can wrap things up by December of uh, 2022. So I want to move in a slightly different direction for my next study. 
this study still focuses on how we can improve anxiety sensitivity measurement. Um, but in this instance, I'm looking at uh, using ecological momentary assessment as a way to test kind of the theoretical underpinnings of anxiety sensitivity. So uh, most of our studies looking at anxiety sensitivity tend to propose that there's a dynamic relationship like you can see in this figure. Um, however, it's very rarely if ever tested. And so um, my goal was to really look at uh, this path over here in the lower right quadrant and, and look at whether uh, the impact of anxiety sensitivity does in fact moderate the experience of anxiety from one moment to the next. And again, like I said, uh, using EMA, which involves collecting data in the real world over the course of days to weeks. And we use the form of EMA called experience sampling, where essentially uh, we're pushing surveys out to people uh, in this instance five times a day, and we're asking them to rate their level of anxiety in that moment, um, whether they experienced a stressor and then a few other additional outcomes. So one reason we do this is that because for a host of reasons, humans can be biased when they're asked to rate their trait levels of anxiety. And so depending upon the moment when somebody comes in, for example, if we had a participant coming in uh, with what would equate to about line 19 here, um, they might rate their, their overall average level of anxiety higher than it um, actually is. And so ecological momentary assessment um, offers a, a better way to potentially capture uh, someone's average levels of anxiety. Um, but in addition to that, there's, there's a lot of uh, other information that can be gained using EMA and that can sort of, uh, again, help us test out some of the central uh, theoretical tenets. Um, one of these components is an autoregressive effect. And again, like I said, this is the, the key component that I'm focusing on. I'm really looking at what is the impact of having anxiety at one session on next session's anxiety rating? And is this stronger for people with elevated anxiety sensitivity? Uh, there's another interesting component, uh, the within person uh, variance. And so essentially uh, everybody has an average level of anxiety here captured by that orange line, but there's also differences in the amount of variability around that level of anxiety. And so often that gets tossed into the error part of our equation, um, but with the approach that I'm talking about here, which is dynamic structural equation modeling, we can actually bring that into the model separate from the error. And we have a way of looking at uh, whether uh, kind of spikes or changes in anxiety are important to focus on. So in this study, there were two primary aims. Uh, the first was to use uh, dynamic structural equation modeling to look at the best fitting model of anxiety. So uh, just briefly, and I won't go into all of the, the nerdy details, but please feel free to email me if you're interested. Uh, dynamic structural equation modeling is a multivariate uh, latent variable approach to conducting multi-level modeling. So I often uh, tell people it's kind of like multi-level modeling on steroids and it addresses uh, a lot of uh, uh, potential issues with traditional multi-level modeling approaches. Uh, the second aim, so in addition to finding the best fitting model, is to test whether anxiety sensitivity uh, is related to overall anxiety, the lagged effect, and anxiety variability. And again, that, that point B, the lagged anxiety, is, is where I'm most interested because uh, if anxiety sensitivity were to predict that, that would be aligned with our, our theoretical representations of this construct. So uh, for this study, participants completed two sessions in our lab, a structured interview followed by uh, self-report measures. Following that, they completed EMA for 14 days, consisting of five quasi-randomly distributed samples. Um, and these surveys took maybe one to two minutes each. Uh, following that and not 
captured in the study. Uh, we also collected a, a small battery of self-report measures after that 14-day EMA period. So the, the final sample uh, was 81 participants after we removed nine for failing attention check items. Um, sample was about 30 years of age and uh, about a third of them met for at least one DSM-5 disorder. As far as the measures that we're using in this study, use the ASI-3 um, and structured clinical interview, uh, anxiety disorder diagnoses at baseline. Uh, the anxiety disorder diagnoses are included as a way to control for uh, an individual's baseline level of anxiety. And then we uh, captured anxious arousal using the ADI-27. Um, and we also asked participants each time we were uh, asking them to rate their anxiety to tell us whether they'd experienced one or more stressors. So uh, just to kind of walk you through the models that I'm going to be fitting, uh, this is the un final unconditional model that I expected to fit the data. So this is essentially models without any external predictors. And you can see how the variance is separated into within and between components. And then one of the, the real beauties of, of DSEM is it's, it's really easy to include things like lagged anxiety sensitivity or lag, lagged anxiety and anxiety variability as random effects at the between person part of the model. And so we can capture not only the intra individual processes of anxiety, uh, but we can capture differences in these processes. So moving to the conditional model, this is the within-person uh, conditional model. You can see the one addition here is that I've added stressful events, and I included that as a fixed effects in this model. And then here's the between-level conditional model. So we have both anxiety sensitivity uh, and anxiety disorders operating as uh, independent variables predicting uh, lagged anxious arousal, average levels of anxious arousal, and the variability. So uh, turning to our results here. Uh, so one of the things just to really quickly and briefly note, uh, DSEM uses Bayesian analysis. And so instead of getting confidence intervals, you get credibility intervals, but they're uh, essentially uh, equivalent here to what you would get if you were using confidence intervals. So this, this AR1 component means we had a significant lagged effect such that uh, prior levels of anxiety increased, at, at higher prior levels of anxiety uh, predicted higher next session levels of anxiety, even controlling for stressful events. Uh, we found significant variability around anxiety scores. And again, we found that a stressful event uh, predicted uh, increased anxiety as would be expected. Uh, so as far as the between person part of the model, uh, happy to report for my hypothesis testing, at least, um, that we did find anxiety sensitivity moderated the impact of prior session on next session. And I didn't uh, put it in here, but when you probe that interaction, you can see that there's a uh, significant, uh, that as anxiety sensitivity is higher, there's a stronger relation between prior sessions anxiety and next sessions anxiety. We also found a significant uh, overall prediction. So AS was related to average levels of anxiety and it also predicted greater variability. So those with higher anxiety sensitivity uh, had more variable anxiety scores when we asked them. Uh, these findings were robust to the presence of an anxiety disorder. And we also found um, smaller, but still significant uh, impacts of having an anxiety disorder on one's uh, level of anxiety. So uh, together, these findings indicate that the uh, um, anxiety sensitivity was associated with average levels of anxiety. Also as hypothesized and kind of confirming our theoretical models, uh, anxiety sensitivity moderated the impact of prior um, anxiety on next occasions anxiety. Um, and this was robust to including uh, an anxiety disorder in the model. 
Um, so what this suggests to me is that these components might offer additional treatment targets. So we might not uh, want to just look at whether we're changing average levels of anxiety, but also maybe whether we're breaking that bond um, in anxiety experienced over time. Because we're all going to experience stressors and you know some of it might be how you react afterwards. Uh, however, there's a, there's a lot of work still needed to determine uh, whether this process is how individuals develop anxiety disorders. And that can be do, uh, done through studies uh, using measurement burst designs where essentially you're capturing uh, intensive longitudinal data, but you're capturing that within longer term uh, data collection periods as well. So as an example, you could capture uh, intensive longitudinal data every three months and, and get an idea both of this kind of more fine-grained fine process and then how it relates to uh, the process more generally. All right, so I moved uh, relatively quickly through that because I wanted to make sure that I have enough time to really focus on uh, this most recent work. This, this work I, I find really uh, cool and I'm, I'm excited that uh, so far the intervention uh, that we developed seems to be working out. Um, so uh, this, this intervention stems from uh, probably in May of the pandemic, I was meeting with the uh, director of clinical training here and I was also meeting with our uh, clinical director, uh, the head of the psychology clinic. And we began to think about how we might be able to sort of help um, people who were suffering uh, from distress just due to the pandemic. And um, sort of was just thinking about the risk factors that I studied and through a stroke of luck, uh, those risk factors seem to be the type of uh, risk factors highly relevant to the pandemic. And so again, that includes anxiety sensitivity and there's, there's a bunch of, uh, recent empirical work demonstrating that high AS um, results in people being more distressed by the COVID pandemic. Um, another risk factor, intolerance of uncertainty, which again, uh, captures distress due to unknown or uncertain situations. Um, this you know, probably goes without saying is highly relevant to the pandemic, given how um, unknown and uncertain things were and how they uh, remain to be. Um, and then finally, I had more recently just moved into looking at social isolation and loneliness. And this is something, again, highly relevant to the pandemic, um, given that uh, we had sort of mandated social uh, uh, physical distancing. And even as we, we, some of those restrictions lift, one, they lift in waves. And so there's, you know, more chances people are going to have to physically distance again. Um, and then two, there's, like we said, a lot of uh, uncertainty still occurring. And, and so it's not necessarily the case that everybody's going to go out and, and be able to kind of get the uh, interactions with others that they want or need. Importantly, uh, when we define loneliness, loneliness uh, isn't being alone. Those are not synonymous. Loneliness actually uh, uh, captures uh, something other than that. And so as, as a kind of pat example, uh, you can be alone and not feel lonely, and you can be lonely in a crowd of people. So the intervention that we developed uses a cognitive behavioral therapy framework. Um, and three primary components to that psychoeducation, where we're uh, helping them understand that negative emotions are common. Um, but not dangerous. Uh, there's where we, the next section is when we challenge cognitive distortions and um, essentially uh, helping people to myth bust as I'll call it. And then the final section involves uh, behavioral experiments, including interoceptive exposure for anxiety sensitivity, and then experiments challenging uh, misconceptions about uncertainty and loneliness for the other risk factors. Uh, the intervention that we call Coping Crew is a virtual group intervention, um, and it's supplemented via a mobile app. 
the intervention itself contains five sessions, a introductory session where we introduce principles of CBT, um, three sessions target, targeting AS, IU, and loneliness, and a booster slash wrap up session. Uh, following each of those sessions, we use ecological momentary intervention as a way to highlight key points made during the intervention, and also as a way to give uh, participants an opportunity to practice the skills that they've gained. So uh, this gives an idea of, of our uh, EMI uh, approach here. So essentially, you can see that in that purple box at the beginning of each day, that represents a fixed sampling occasion. So every morning, we ask participants to give us ratings of their mood and anxiety. And then we deliver three quasi-random prompts throughout the day uh, to also capture mood and anxiety. Uh, during those occasions, if participants report uh, elevated anxiety, uh, we, that's when we then intervene by giving them some sort of reminder uh, related to the, uh, the distress, basically kind of our myth-busting component. And then finally, with the app that we use, uh, participants can uh, are reminded that they have uh, uh, behavioral experiments as homework, and they can use the app to uh, track their progress with that. So for this intervention, we just completed our first uh, two research groups, uh, totaled uh, eight participants. These were uh, the, the first participants that were interested were all of uh, college age, they were all female, um, and they were primarily white. So uh, looking at the primary risk factors, we find uh, pretty large reductions from baseline to our post-intervention six weeks later in anxiety sensitivity, in intolerance of uncertainty, and in loneliness. And while this is only in eight people, and, and of course we uh, wouldn't really wanna make any broad sweeping conclusions from these eight people, it's uh, a better direction than seeing no effects at all. So there, there could be something there as far as the, the signal for the intervention. And that's further borne out when we look at the ratings of anxiety, depression, and functional impairment uh, due to uh, kind of existing during the COVID-19 pandemic. And so again, uh, we can see we're, we're getting reductions in anxiety and depression and that functional impairment. And while these aren't significant, uh, they're trending in the direction we would expect. So we're expecting that they would reduce these. And with a larger sample, um, much like other interventions, I really want to be focusing on uh, the mechanism. So do changes in AS lead to these changes in anxiety and depression? Uh, so the final part for this study that I want to touch on is uh, our, our main focus, which was basically uh, when we developed this intervention, the first thing we wanted to do is determine whether it's acceptable and feasible to the audience. And so uh, we collected uh, these data doing a, an exit interview as well as some semi-structured questionnaires. And we found for the intervention itself, the vast majority of our participants uh, thought it was beneficial. They thought it reduced their anxiety, their loneliness, their depression, their stress. Um, and most, if not all participants expected that they would maintain any gains that they made. Um, looking at the mobile app, it is a, it is a less clear picture. Um, generally, people approved of the surveys. There was a uh, some debate among the participants as far as whether the mobile app uh, helped them to reduce their surveys. Um, and there was one person who just really disagreed or strongly disagreed to using the app in general. So this is, this is really one of the biggest, uh, my biggest takeaways from this is uh, attempting to figure out how to make this mobile por portion more acceptable. Because while the participants didn't think didn't report it being particularly effective. Um, I, I think it's in part because they're being asked to think about their anxiety in, in their environment. And so um, I think it is effective. I just think it's, it's difficult for people to uh, 
to perceive it that way when they're being asked to approach their anxiety more than they might uh, feel comfortable with in the moment. Uh, additional data on acceptability and feasibility. Everybody agreed that this is something they would recommend to others. In fact, uh, one of the clients already indicated they were recommending it to all of their friends. Um, and everybody agreed that uh, it would be helpful for others with loneliness, anxiety, or stress. Uh, as far as the, the utility, so uh, most people found uh, the intervention to be effective. Um, and again, you can see where the ratings were a little bit lower had to do with completing that homework. And I, I find that fascinating because as clinicians, we know that, you know, homework is going to really help uh, drive home these effects. We, we have plenty of analogies to make this point. I tend to talk about the analogy of using a personal trainer and how you, you need to go to the gym outside of that one appointment. And so it's, it's interesting to find that you know, even though we, we make that point, the uh, participants don't necessarily view it that way. Um, everybody uh, generally found the intervention to be useful. Uh, most participants were uh, very satisfied. Um, everybody was very to mostly satisfied. Um, and most people thought they would come back if they needed to. So next steps for this particular study, um, we're actually in the process of scheduling meetings with uh, a group of clinicians who we met with when we were designing the intervention to run the, uh, the scope of what we were doing by them. So we're hoping to do that in the end of November, uh, beginning of December. Uh, following that, we're going to incorporate the revisions uh, to the intervention based on what we learned doing our exit interviews and during the sessions with our stakeholders. Uh, we're completing two more groups at the beginning of the spring. And then my, my final uh, hopeful next step will be to conduct a, a SMART trial um, where I'm really looking at uh, what modules are important, uh, whether the order of those modules are important and sort of what mobile app components make it uh, acceptable to participants. Um, so I'm just going to briefly touch on uh, some future directions uh, so that I can leave the last 10 or so minutes for any uh, potential questions that you may have. Um, so future directions that I have include uh, improving these brief interventions based on participant feedback. Uh, they include figuring out ways to improve engagement with the mobile app. Um, I just recently attended a uh, M Health workshop hosted by the National Institutes of Health over here. And, and there's a lot of people doing some really great work focused on engagement. And so I've uh, reached out to some of my colleagues hoping to, to pick their brains to figure out um, how do we get somebody to engage, engage with the anxiety app when it's, it's something that <clears throat> they often would rather avoid. And then the, the final big picture approach that I want to take combines my earlier work focusing on biological correlates. And, and one of the things I'm really interested in looking at is, are we getting the same changes in these biological correlates reflecting the underlying uh, neural structure of these disorders uh, that we find when we're just delivering them via self-report? Uh, so to conclude, uh, I have no uh, financial conflicts of interest or of any kind. This uh, contents of this talk don't represent the views of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, I would like to thank the sponsors who have funded this work. And then I also want to thank uh, my lab. So this is our lab meetings have had to be virtual, but this is uh, the factors of emotional and affective risk lab at Ohio University. And I want to thank my colleagues at the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. And so uh, without further ado, I am uh, uh, happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Nick, for your talk. It's quite interesting. And you've been doing lots of different work. And, and at the same time, all these things are kind of combining to the, and they go into one direction. 
direction how actually to deal with the anxiety mm -hmm. uh, sensitivity in order to prevent development of different emotional disorders uh, so thank you thank you really uh, i i would just let other people uh, 